This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 28 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2, Chapter 21 The Deeds of the Good to the Evil. The new arrivals are forlorn and dejected, a look of fear and despair in their eyes. The long-timers among them seem dazed, as if with some terrible shock, and fall upon the bed in stupor-like sleep. The boys from the reformatories, some mere children in their teens, weep and moan and tremble at the officer's footstep. Only the repeaters and old-timers preserve their composure, scoff at the fresh fish, nod at old acquaintances, and exchange vulgar pleasantries with the guards. But all soon grow nervous and irritable, and stand at the door, leaning against the bars, an expression of bewildered hopelessness or anxious expectancy on their faces. They yearn for companionship, and are pathetically eager to talk, to hear the sound of a voice, to unbosom their heavy hearts. I am minutely familiar with every detail of their case, their life history, their hopes and fears. Through the endless weeks and months on the range, their tragedies are the sole subject of conversation. A glance into the mournful faces, pressed close against the bars, and the panorama of misery rises before me. The cell-house grows more desolate, bleaker, the air gloomier, and more depressing. There is Giuseppe, his bright eyes lighting up with a faint smile as I pause at his door. "'Hello, Alec,' he greets me in his sweet, sad voice. He knows me from the jail. His father and elder brother have been executed, and he commuted to life because of youth. He is barely eighteen, but his hair has turned white. He has been acting queerly of late. At night I often hear him muttering and walking, walking incessantly and muttering. There is a peculiar look about his eyes, restless, roving. Alec, he says suddenly, "'We want to tell you something. You no tell nobody, yes?' Assured I'll keep his confidence, he begins to talk quickly, excitedly. "'Nobody there, Alec? No screw? Shh! Last night me see my brother. Yes, see Gianni. Jesu Christo, me see my poor brother in the cellar here, and then me father he come. Brother and father, they stay there, on the floor, and so quiet, uh, like a dead. And then they come and lay down uh, in my bed. Oh, Jesu Christo, me so afraid, uh, me cry and pray. You not know what it mean? No? Me tell you. It mean me die. Me die soon. His eyes glow with a sombre fire, a hectic flush on his face. He knits his brows, as I essay to calm him, and continues hurriedly. Shh! Wait a me tell you all. You know what for my father and Gianni come out of the grave? Me tell you. They call her for revenge, cause they innocente. Me tell you truth. See, we all work in the mine, the coal mine. Me and my father and Gianni. All work a hard and make one dollar, maybe dollar quarter the day. And bigger American man, him come and bother my father. My father, him no want a trouble. Him old man, no water nobody. And the American man, him make a two dollars and maybe two fifty the day. And him bother my father all the time. Bother him and kick him to the legs and steal my brother's shovel and hide father's hat and make a trouble for my countrymen and call us dirty dagos. And one day him and two Irish, they all drunk and smash my father, an American man, an Irish holler. Dago, so be, afraid of fight. And the American man, him take a bigger pickaxe and want to hit my father. And my father, him run. And me and my border and friend, we fight. An American man, him fall. And we all go way home. Then please come and arrest me and father and brother, and say we kill a American man. Me and my brother no use knife. Maybe my friend do. Me no know. Him no arrest her. Him go home in Italia. My father and brother, they save nine to seven dollar, and me save twenty-five, and got a lair. Him no good, and no talk much in court. We poor men, no can take case in order court, and father him hang, and Gianni hang, and me get life. My father and brother, they come last a night from the grave. Cause the innocente and want a revenge, and me got a mac revenge. Me no rest, got a. The sharp snapping of Johnny the runner warns me of danger, and I hastily leave. The melancholy figures line the doors as I walk up and down the hall. 
The blanched faces peer wistfully through the bars, or lean dejectedly against the wall, a vacant stare in the dim eyes. Each calls to mind the stories of misery and distress, the scenes of brutality and torture I witness in the prison house. Like ghastly nightmares the shadows pass before me. There is silent Nick, restlessly pacing his cage, never ceasing, his lips sealed in brutish muteness. For three years he has not left the cell, nor uttered a word. The stolid features are cut and bleeding. Last night he had attempted suicide, and the guards beat him, and left him unconscious on the floor. There is crazy Hunky, the Austrian. Every morning, as the officer unlocks his door to hand in the loaf of bread, he makes a wild dash for the yard, shouting, "'Me wife! Where's me wife?' He rushes toward the front, and desperately grabs the door-handle. The double iron gate is securely locked, a look of blank amazement on his face. He slowly returns to the cell. The guards await him with malicious smile. Suddenly they rush upon him, black jacks in hand. Me wife, me seen her, the Austrian cries. The blood gushing from his mouth and nose, they kick him into the cell. Me wife waiting in the yard, he moans. In the next cell is Tommy Wellman, adjoining him Jim Grant. They are boys recently transferred from the reformatory. They cower in the corner, in terror of the scene. With tearful eyes they relate their story. Orphans in the slums of Allegheny, they have been sent to the reform school at Morganza for snatching fruit off a corner stand. Maltreated and beaten, they sought to escape. Childishly, they set fire to the dormitory, almost in sight of the keepers. I says to me chum, says I, Tommy narrates with boyish glee. Kid, says I, let's fire the lousy joint. There'll be lots of fun, and we'll make our getaway in the excitement. They were taken to court, and the good judge sentenced them to five years to the penitentiary. I'm glad to get out of that dump, Tommy comments. It was just fierce. They paddled and starved us something terrible. In the basket cell, a young colored man grovels on the floor. It is Lancaster, number 8523. He was serving seven years and working every day in the mat shop. Slowly the days passed, and at last the longed-for hour of release arrived. But Lancaster was not discharged. He was kept at his task, the warden informing him that he had lost six months of his good time for defective work. The light-hearted negro grew sullen and morose. Often the silence of the cell-house was pierced by his anguished cry in the night, "'My time's up! Time's up! I want to go home!' The guards would take him from the cell and place him in the dungeon. One morning, in a fit of frenzy, he attacked Captain McVeigh, the officer of the shop. The captain received a slight scratch on the neck, and Lancaster was kept chained to the wall of the dungeon for ten days. He returned to the cell, a driveling imbecile. The next day they dressed him in his citizen clothes, Lancaster mumbling, "'Going home! Going home!' The warden and several officers accompanied him to court, on the way coaching the poor idiot to answer yes to the question, "'Do you plead guilty?' He received seven years, the extreme penalty of the law, for the attempted murder of a keeper. They brought him back to the prison and locked him up in a basket cell, the barred door covered with a wire screen that almost entirely excludes light and air. He receives no medical attention, and is fed on a bread-and-water diet. The witless negro crawls on the floor, unwashed and unkempt, scratching with his nails fantastic shapes on the stone and babbling stupidly, "'Going, Jesus, going to Jerusalem. See, he rides the holy ass. He's going to his father's home. Going home, going home.' As I pass, he looks up, perplexed wonder on his face, his brows meet in a painful attempt to collect his wandering thoughts, and he draws with pathetic sing-song, "'Going home, going home, Jesus going to Father's home.' Guards raise their hands to their nostrils as they approach the cell. The poor imbecile evacuates on the table, the chair, and the floor. Twice a month he is taken to the bathroom. His clothes are stripped, and the hose is turned on the crazy negro. The cell of little Sammy is vacant. He was number 9521, a young man from Altoona, I knew him quite well. He was a kind boy and a diligent worker, but now and then he would fall into a fit of melancholy. He would then sit motionless on the chair, a blank stare on his face, neglecting food and work. These spells generally lasted two or three days, Sammy refusing to leave the cell. Old Jimmy McPain, the dead deputy, on such occasions commanded the prisoner to the shop, while Sammy sat and stared in a daze. McPain would order the stubborn kid to the dungeon, and every time Sammy got his head working, he was dragged, silent and motionless, to the cellar. The new deputy has followed the established practice, and last evening, at music hour, 
while the men were scraping their instruments, little Sammy was found on the floor of the cell, his throat hacked from ear to ear. At the coroner's inquest the warden testified that the boy was considered mentally defective, that he was therefore excused from work and never punished. Returning to my cell in the evening, my gaze meets the printed rules on the wall. The prison authorities desire to treat every prisoner in their charge with humanity and kindness. The aim of all prison discipline is, by enforcing the law, to restrain the evil and to protect the innocent from further harm, to so apply the law upon the criminal as to produce a cure from his moral infirmities by calling out the better principles of his nature. End of section 28 Recording by Stephen Harvey This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.